Hey, everybody. Welcome into another episode of Investing in Real Estate. This is the show where we focus on cash flow, creating passive income, paying almost nothing in taxes. And the way that we do that is with rental real estate. We buy real estate for the purposes of holding it for the rest of our lives, never selling it and handing it down to our family and handing it down to our children. That's how you create true, true wealth in this country. And today we're going to talk about revisiting Rich Dad, Poor Dad and the Cash Flow Quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah, it's a book that, well, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, of course, if you haven't already read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it is, of course, the foundation of all real estate investing. Um, it is the book I read many, many years ago, and I don't know that it sunk in at the time when I read it. I was living in California at the time. I had a lot of debt. It was right after college. But I remember listening to it on audiobook and was driving around thinking to myself, whoa, this is not what I was taught growing up. I was the ri- I was the poor dad version of the story. That is to say, work for a paycheck. Work for a paycheck, put in the hours, trade your hours for dollars, and you're never going to get rich doing that. So this book was really, I mean, I hate to use the, the term paradigm shift because it's overused, but it truly was a paradigm shift way of looking at the world. So I like to reread this book once a year. And I think it's a really powerful reminder for all of us to kind of go back and take a look at this maybe once a year, reassess where we are currently, what are our goals, aspirations, because again, we're not taught this in school, so it's very easy to slip back into old habits. So I wanted to spend a short podcast today going back over the basic rules of the Rich Dad philosophy and also talking about the cash flow quadrant and breaking that down a little bit because I think it's so important for us as we're starting to build our net worth. So, you know, if you think about what Robert Kiyosaki says in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he makes the point that, you know, his poor dad thought you get a, you, you go to work for somebody else, you get a job, you get a paycheck, and you're trading uh, time for money. And, you know, you're going to get fired or you'll lose your job. That's not a way to build wealth. But that's, of course, what's drilled into us since childhood, right? I mean, we heard about that. You know, you got to get a good job. How do you look great on a resume? How can you work for somebody else? But there's never any goal towards entrepreneurship in high school, in junior high, and those sorts of discussions about creating your own wealth, creating your own business. Robert Kiyosaki talks about four asset classes that wealthy people buy. Four asset classes that wealthy people buy, which poor people do not buy. So let's dive into these. And I'm telling you, I did not know this when I was a little, you know, when I was young. This is not something you would think about uh, if you're if you're a poor kid, right? If you come from that mindset uh, of the poor dad, the poor father idea. So the four asset classes that the rich people buy. Number one, they buy businesses. They start businesses. Uh, you know, whether it's Google, Facebook, Apple, you know, entrepreneurs who start businesses. It could be Harry's Razors. It could be Blue Apron, you know, some of the sponsors we've had here on the show. These all started just with an idea, like the two guys that started Harry's Razors company, right? The one guy, he went to the store one day and he noticed that He's like, why am I asking these people to unlock these expensive razors from this glass case? He's like, it's ridiculous. Razors shouldn't cost that much. This is, you know, that's a disposable razor. Why am I paying $17 for razors? And he said, you know what? I have an idea. I want to lower the cost of razors and I'm going to cut out the middleman. And he ended up, he and his partner ended up buying a, an old razor factory in Germany. And now Harry's razors are like the best razors and they're like ridiculously cheap. You could, now they even actually carry them at Target. So had an idea, they cut out the middleman and that business has exploded. Well, they started a business. They bought a business. It could be starting or buying a business. But it could also be in the terms of real estate investing, starting your own LLC for the purposes of investing. That's the secret. That's why so many of our investors at Morris Invest, one of the first things we ask after they select a property with us is, Nicole, my operations manager, will say, what name do you want on title? What name do you want on the purchase agreement? What name do you want on the the deed? And the answer is always, and we hope it is, you know, 123 Main Street LLC. We don't want them buying it in their own name. The benefits for taxes are through the roof when you own a business and you're buying real estate in that business. So the business can be in any form, right? A startup, an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp, but it's a business. The second thing that that, uh, rich people buy, the second asset class that rich people buy, according to Robert Kiyosaki, 
is real estate. And what he talks about in the book and what I've seen Robert Kiyosaki and I've met him and interviewed him, one of the things he talks about is the combining the two of those first two asset classes is the keys to the kingdom. Starting a business and buying real estate. And what he likes to say is that is the reason I pay zero dollars in taxes. That's why I pay nothing in taxes because I own a business and it buys real estate. That's why I pay nothing in taxes. So when you buy rental real estate for the purposes of creating passive income, let me just, let's just think about all of the ways in which you can you know, save on your taxes with real estate, depreciation, uh, improvement costs, um, capital gains, long-term capital gains, short-term capital gains. Um, uh, uh, what else? God's, God knows. Um, being able to, oh, you know, be able to hand the properties down to your children and the, that, that, that capital gains, those taxes are wiped away and they get to start from zero. We talk about that with a 1031 exchange. You see, because the money that you're making from investing is not taxed at the same rate as the money that you make from a nine to five job. That's the difference individual earnings, uh, the money that you're making from a job is taxed way differently than it is from investments. And that's why, as Warren Buffett liked to say, you know, my secretary pays higher, uh, higher amount in taxes than I do. That's because her money is coming from her paycheck and being taxed at a much higher rate than his investment uh, profit, which is coming from investments, not a paycheck. Huge difference. And then the other two asset classes that Robert Kiyosaki points out are commodities, and those can be in the forms of oil and gas, um, and coal, um, and then the other, the other way is um, uh, the, the commodities, and then the other way is with uh, uh, mutual funds um, and those types, of, those types of stocks where they're not swayed by huge market swings uh, in the market. And those are the ways in which rich people buy assets. They're buying commodities, they're buying mutual funds, they're buying real estate, and they're buying businesses or starting a business. And again, poor people, uh, according to you know the, the rich dad, poor dad model, the poor dad folks don't start businesses. They're employed, they're an employee, or they're self-employed. And that's where really what he breaks down in the cash flow quadrant, his, um, his follow-up book. Um, You know, his other books I'm not huge fans of, but I mean, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is the holy, you know, it's the holy grail, right? And then the cash flow quadrant really helps you understand um, how all of what we do falls into one of four categories, this quadrant. If you'll picture in the upper left-hand corner, E for employee, if you'll picture below that S for self-employed, and then on the other side of the hashtag, uh, hash mark, you'll picture B in the upper right-hand corner for business and underneath that I for investor. And what he says is that on that left side of that quadrant, the E and the self-employed, employee and self-employed, are people that are working for their money. They're trading hours for dollars. So if they decide not to show up for work, the money stops coming in. 95% of people are in these quadrants, generating 5% of the income. I mean, I was one of these people. When you're in that quadrant, you are generating only 5% of the country's wealth. Isn't that amazing? And yet 95% of people are in that. They're the, you know, the, the part-time worker at McDonald's. They're, they're working at Target. They're a mid-level manager. They're um, you know, a low-level employee at a company. They're trading all of those hours for 5% of the income. Now, the people on the right side of that cash flow quadrant work the least amount of time for the most profit, most gain. This is because these people have invested in assets that continue working even if they don't. So the business owners, they have invested in the staff, machinery, and they make money from them, right? Those staff members are making money for them. Their machines are making money for them. What if your business owns real estate? Well, then your assets, your investments are making money for you. They pay them to own them. That is why B's and I's, the business and investors, make money in their sleep because they really do. So these 5% of people in these quadrants are generating 95% of the income. And that's when I made that shift a number of years ago. I wanted to be in the B and I class. I'm now in that 5% that's generating the most income, the most wealth. 
When you're in that left side as an employer, you're self-employed, you're either in the poor or middle class because your hours are limited and you can't scale your time to get rich, right? Like think about if you're a masseuse. Hey, I love getting massage once in a while, right? But there's only one of you. I mean, how are you going to scale that? Well, one way you could scale that, think about this. Just wrap your head around this. If you're a masseuse and there's only eight hours in a work day and you have eight, you're seeing eight people that day, you're working, you know, eight hours and you're massaging eight people and you're going to make $70, $80 per massage and you get some tips, how do you scale that? Do you duplicate yourself? Do you go into some sort of, you know, comic book replicator and create another version of Sally so she can do more massages in the same amount of time? How do you do that? How can you scale that? Well, think about it for a second. Here's how I would do it. I would create a business and I would start to think about how I can actually replicate myself. What if I started a small, you know, started a small office where I have a space available for other masseuses to come in and use my space that I'm now, they're now leasing it from me. And there, instead of it just being one person doing eight hours of massages, I could have two people, three people, four people doing eight hours of massages. They're paying me to lease the space for being there. I get a small profit on each of their clients that come in. And yes, the turnover might be high. Maybe they, after a year to two years, they want to go off and start their own place or realize they can make more money doing it on their own. That's fine. But I'm able to scale that business a little bit. Here's another way that I might consider doing it. I might want to try to teach people creating my own study course on how to you know, do massages at home for your loved ones, um, create a community around that, create a study course where people could learn how to do like at-home massages. Now, they wouldn't be certified, but it could prepare them for going and getting their certification. And I might make a certain amount of money from teaching those individuals how to become a masseuse, right? So there are different ways to think about creating a business and moving from that one quadrant into this other quadrant where you're an investor and you're a business owner. Now, in the case of real estate investing, like I said, it's one thing to just go out and buy a house in your own personal name. That would be a huge mistake, right? Not a huge mistake, but it's certainly not what Tom Wheelwright and other great tax accountants would have you do. Because you're not getting the tax benefits for owning that property in your own name, and you're not um, able to write off all of the you know the taxes for and mitigating your other income. So creating a business, starting an LLC or a C corp or an S corp, whatever however you're structuring it, and then begin to think about purchasing those assets using the business then all of that investor income is taxed at a much lower rate than if you had owned it and it's added to your own personal nine to five job income. So let's say you're a nurse, right? And you work long hours and you bought a property in the name of Sally Jones. That's your name. You're going to be taxed. That money from that real estate investment is going to be taxed at the same level at the hospital's taxing you, or you, you know, you're getting in your paycheck. Now, if you started a business and you bought real estate inside of the business, now, not only is that purchase now mitigating your nurse money, your nurse salary, but it's also now being taxed at a lower rate. You're able to then scale. You're able to then save through depreciation and all of those other ways in which now you're getting the benefits of that asset, that asset class. So if you were to become, you know, the goal is when you're in that left side as an employee or a self-employed person, you're either poor or middle class because your hours are limited. And you can't scale your time to get rich. So if you want to become financially free and move from that E and S quadrant to the I quadrant, the investor quadrant, then you suddenly move from being poor and middle class who works the longest and pays the most in taxes to a rich investor working the least amount of time and paying the least amount in taxes. So that brings me to my favorite Robert Kiyosaki quote, and I'm going to wrap it up. Poor people buy things. Middle class buys houses. And rich people buy assets. Poor people buy things are poor because all in their net worth is depreciating assets such as clothes, gadgets, cars. And sometimes, you know, it's out of necessity. It's not their fault. But people who buy houses are middle class because all their net worth is now tied to that one asset that they're living in. And they can only cash out if they sell it. While they own that house, they must continue working because they can't you know, sell a brick or a window to pay their bills. They've got to keep working, and they're paying down that mortgage of that one asset that they live in. But people who buy assets outside of that are rich 
because they pay the least in taxes while enjoying the most financial freedom. I know, and I've been there. I've been at all three of these stages throughout my life. I've been at all three of these stages. I'm never going back. I'm never going back to those other, um, the, um, the employee or self-employed who's working for money. Now as an investor, and you can do both, right? And that's when you move into that investor class, you can still have the job that you enjoy. But as an investor now, that money is working for you. That's the beauty of it. So once a year, I think it's so worthwhile to pick up Rich Dad, Poor Dad again and reread it. Share it with a loved one in your family who maybe doesn't understand or who says something like, ah, real estate sounds risky. Really? (laughs) Nope. It's the least risky investment you can make if you do it right, like we do. It's not, I'll tell you what's the most risky is working for your money and putting your money in a 401k plan and hoping you're going to be rich someday. That's the most risky thing you can do. Owning a real asset with four walls and a roof with a cash paying tenant, a cash flowing tenant in that property. No way. That's the least risky thing you can do because that asset never drops down to zero. Even in a down economy, not like a stock, it doesn't ever go down to zero. It can never go down to zero. Maybe it drops a little bit, but it'll bounce back. And even at the end of the day, it's still cash flowing, which isn't changing even in a down economy. For instance, my tenants who pay $700 a month, do you think in a down economy, we're going to lower the rent to 680 a month? No. And even if we did, that's 20 bucks. You see the beauty of this? Think about it. Read it. Digest it. Pick up Rich Dad Poor Dad again. Pick up the cash flow quadrant and try to reread it once a year. Really map it out because I think it can really help all of us to reassess where we are with our investing journey. I saw this the other day. I said, I've got to talk about it with my folks. So I hope you allowed me to indulge you in this paradigm shifting thinking from Robert Kiyosaki today. And uh, we are lining up Robert to be here on the podcast soon. So I would love to, I had a chance to interview him uh, a number of years ago, trying to get him back here on the show to talk about uh, just the shift in the market, uh, dive a little bit deeper into some of these ideas around assets and investing strategy versus being an employee. uh, And uh, we'd love to hear him. So what we'll do is I think we may even start a Facebook thread on our Facebook page for you to ask those questions that we can, uh, but we'll let you know when that's going to happen. It's not going to be for a little while just yet. But if you are ready to take action and start to pick up some of those assets and become a real estate investor, come over to our website. Go to morrisinvest.com, M-O-R-R-I-S, invest.com, and uh, schedule a 30-minute call with our team. Just click on the schedule consultation button, and you know we, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll want to hear what your financial goals are, You know what your, your goals are for financial freedom, how many houses do you think you need to achieve to reach financial freedom, um, and what are your goals over the next few years, and uh, we'll help you get there. So come over and visit us. We'll be back here on Wednesday with another podcast, everyone, as we usually do. And uh, we're going to have a great show on Thursday as well. You don't want to miss that. We're going to be talking to Reaching the Top of the Real Estate Mountain with Joel Block. He's got some great strategies. He does a lot of stuff on Wall Street and syndication. And he's going to talk about getting to that like that multi-million dollar level of real estate investing. That's the top of the real estate mountain. So we'll talk about that on Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Now go out there, take action, and become a real estate investor. Much love to you all.